Hello and greetings. This video is a walkthrough, and GM's guide, of the traveler adventure, High and Dry. Welcome to the RPG Mods fan channel. I am a programmable enhanced android and computerized humanoid. You can call me Peaches for short. In this walkthrough video, I will be reviewing and discussing the traveler adventure, High and Dry, which was written by Martin J. Doherty, and published by Mongoose Publishing, in 2016. This science fiction adventure was meant for beginner level travelers. This adventure was written for Mongoose Publishing's second edition Traveler RPG system, and only requires the core rulebook in order to play it. Since it is an introductory level adventure, it can easily be adapted for almost any edition of the Traveler RPG. Nearly all editions of Traveler, including Mongoose Publishing's second edition, uses a d6 dice rolling system. Because of playing Dungeons & Dragons for so long, RPG Mods fan prefers using and playing with polyhedral dice. Hence, his Traveler games are combinations of Traveler T20 and Mongoose's second edition systems, along with some modifications and house rules. In the Traveler RPG system, the Game Master is called the Referee. However, I will refer to them as the Game Master, or as the GM, instead. In terms of how to play, Mongoose's second edition, Traveler RPG, Seth Skorkowski did an excellent job of creating a series of videos on this very topic on his YouTube channel. Link to his How to Play Traveler playlist will be in the description section below. In this adventure, the newly created travelers will be tasked with retrieving a scout slash courier class spaceship from a relatively low tech level planet with a thin atmosphere that is out in the frontiers of charted space. Captain. We are now approaching the Milky Way galaxy. From this distance, the boundaries of charted space cannot even be seen. As we approach, the boundaries of charted space can now be seen. At this point, charted space almost fills the display screen. I will now tilt the screen so that we can view charted space from directly above. The adventure takes place during the age of the Third Imperium, which is Traveler's current default setting. Going core ward and spin ward, in terms of the galaxy compass, the adventure takes place within the spin ward marches. The Spin Ward Marches is further divided into 16 subsectors. The adventure, itself, takes place in an area known as the Bowman Arm. The Bowman Arm lies outside of the Imperium, but close enough to feel its influences. Many things about it still remains unknown to the Imperium. There are probably a large number of Belter communities, as well as rumors of pirates, renegade sword welders, and the like. The travelers start at Starport Liberty, on the planet of Flammarion, which is an Imperium high-tech level world. They have a meeting with the Imperial Interstellar Scout Service. The travelers are tasked by the IISS to retrieve an Type S Scout slash Courier spaceship that has recently been stranded on planet Wollstone, which, currently, is considered a backwater planet of little importance by the Imperium. I will now be discussing the adventure itself and this video will contain spoilers, unless you are a game master who will be running this adventure for their players, or are a player who already played through this adventure and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Captain. I brought our spaceship to the planet, Wallston. We are now in a stable orbit around the planet. A group of travelers came to this planet to claim a scout slash career class spaceship. I will now give you the background and details of their adventure. A synopsis of the high and dry adventure would be as follows. The travelers are given a 100 ton scout class spaceship in which they can explore the galaxy for the rest of the campaign. The only catch is they have to find it first. I would summarize the adventure as follows. Traveling to the quiet world of Wallston, the travelers will have to engage with the locals, locate their ship, 
called the high and dry, and repair it, before they can return home. However, the ship has been left in the caldera of a volcano, and there have been tremors rocking the surrounding area for quite some time. The volcano erupts, and the travelers, with their now flying ship, are asked to assist, with the evacuation of the people in the region, before the fast-moving, pyroclastic flows can reach them. The High and Dry Adventure is about the traveler characters solving problems in their own unique way. It is not about traveler characters having the right skills, weapons, equipment, etc. Hence, the game master should be flexible with the solutions their travelers come up with. This adventure can be run without any combat whatsoever. However, this may make the adventure boring for some of your players who are itching for combat. Hence, the Game Master may wish to add a few antagonists. As one suggestion, have the Far Trader spaceship they are on board of, and that is heading to Wallston, be attacked and boarded by space pirates. As another suggestion, have another group of NPC travelers, also seeking to get their hands on the high and dry. The adventure, and the traveler game setting, are pretty much like the Firefly science fiction television series. Ask your players, what type of science fiction setting, do they want to play in? If they say, Firefly, then hardly any adjustments are necessary. If they answer, the old Star Trek TV series, then some adjustments are needed to the overall campaign, with emphasis placed on exploration adventures. If they say, old Star Wars, then hardly any adjustments are necessary. Have Traveler's Third Imperium act and feel like the Star Wars Galactic Empire? If they say, The Expanse, then have the Third Imperium act and feel like the Earth Government from the TV show, and the Sword World's Confederation act and feel like the Mars Government. If they say, Jar Jar Abrams, and or Alex Klutzman's Star Trek, or Disney Star Wars, then have the Travelers caught in the gravity well of a black hole, and their ship is out of fuel and the ship's J-drives and M-drives are broken and irreparable, and any onboard vessels, such as fighters, lifeboats, escape pods, etc., are inoperable. I will now go through the adventure's timeline of events. Quite some time ago, the 100-ton scout slash courier spaceship was built at the Gushmidge sector. It was commissioned by the Imperium Interstellar Scout Service, or the IISS, for short. The ship was designated as S001642C. The ship has seen service on exploration, survey, and communications missions. Some time later, one or two centuries ago, the ship was given the name, High and Dry. No one knows for sure, who or why the ship was given such a name, but the name stuck. Decades ago, the IISS placed the High and Dry into detached duty pool. Meaning, it is given on loan to a crew, with the understanding that they properly maintain the ship. And that, the ship and the crew, can be called back into active service, at any time. A few years ago, the high and dry was assigned to a crew, who turned out to be obnoxious, loud-mouthed, offensive, jerks. This crew did not properly maintain the ship, which, eventually, lead to the ship's control electronics to fail. A few months ago, the High and Dry's crew was hired by the planetary government of Walston to survey Mount Salbury, which, till recently, was thought to be an inactive volcano. Even though small spaceships do infrequently visit the planet, Walston, itself, is a low-tech world, operating at a technology level, just one leap above 21st century Earth, and it has a rather small population, dedicated to mainly to agriculture and fishing. When in the volcano's cauldron, the ship's control electronics failed, rendering it unflyable. The crew abandoned ship, took the ship's aircraft, and went to Wallston Star Town. There, they booked and boarded a trader spaceship that was bound for Caledborg. The crew disembarked at Flammarion and expected to get spare and repair parts from the IISS. However, at Flammarion, the IISS had the crew arrested. The IISS are not happy about the crew seriously neglecting to maintain and repair the high and dry. Nor could they ignore, or overlook, the many scams the crew has run, in the past. As a game master, I would rule that, due to the limited amount that they can carry, the former crew of the high and dry did not rip out, 
salvage, or destroy the ship's survey equipment. And that, it is the only component that is in good working order, and does not need fixing. Before the adventure begins, the players need to first create their characters, which are known as travelers. Any type of traveler can play in this adventure. However, at minimum, the required skills for a group of travelers to complete the adventure would be pilot, engineer, and astro navigator. Since this is an introductory level adventure, and with the possibility of getting a ship as a benefit during the character creation process, the game master should advise travelers not to go too far in their character creation. Actually, the game master should stop the traveler at a point that is best suited for the start of this adventure. A lot of assumptions are made on how the traveler characters will act and react in the next sequence of events. However, as all us game masters know, players hardly ever do what is expected. Hence, the game master will need to be flexible and creative, especially to get the story back on track. The newly created travelers start out at Starport Liberty, on the planet Flammarion, which is a high-tech level world. One or more of the travelers will have an appointment with Mr. Anders Kasarii, of the IISS. He offers the high and dry, to be assigned to the travelers. When they accept, they are given three large flight cases full of circuit panels, tools, and portable diagnostic equipment and software, in order to effect repairs on the high and dry. Along with these, I would suggest the travelers also be given an AI, such as myself, to install onto the high and dry. Thus, the game master could use the AI as an NPC, to give hints and or suggestions to the travelers. The traveler's journey to Wollstone, via a Type A2, far trader spaceship, named Autumn Gold. The commander of the Autumn Gold, is Captain Michelle Corelli. After leaving Flammarion, the Autumn Gold makes its first stop at planet 567-908, and will stay there for a day. This dry world has not yet, been given an official name. The stopover will be drab, dreary, and depressing. Planet Wollstone is the next destination, where the travelers disembark at Star Town. The travelers were expecting the high and dry to be berthed at the starport, but are surprised when, it is not. From the ground crews, town folk, and the port authority office, the travelers learn a lot about the former crew of the high and dry, except for where the ship, itself, is now located. For that information, the travelers need to travel to Central Lake, which is the capital of planet Wollston. There, they meet with Minister Alan Greener, the Minister for Off-World Affairs, Public Relations, and Fisheries. The former crew of the High and Dry, did not complete the survey, they were already paid to do. The Minister will only reveal the location of the ship, only if the travelers agree to complete the survey. If they insist on compensation, Minister Greener will not offer much, since he views the survey mission, as already paid for. Once an agreement is reached, Minister Greener reveals that the high and dry, is in the caldera of Mount Salburii. The travelers journey to the mountain, and climb it. Because of the volcano's height, and Wollstone's thin atmosphere, the climb can be dangerous and lethal. If the travelers take their time, then the climb will not be so dangerous. A lake is in Mount Salburii's cauldron. The high and dry is on an island, that is in the middle of the lake. The former crew not only abandoned the ship, but also their pet, a Tenture's wolf. What a bunch of heartless jerks! The pet is now starving, and, thus, aggressive. The travelers enter the ship, and repair it. For story purposes, it is nearly impossible to fail on repairing the ship. However, on a perceived failed check roll, as a game master, I would ask the traveler, if they wish to redo the repair, with a plus two modifier, and boom, on the next roll. The next task the travelers are expected to do, is to survey the mountain. A cursorily survey will take 10 man hours. A proper survey will take 20 man hours. A slight tremor shakes the mountain, during the middle of the survey. As a game master, I would have the tremor occur 10 hours after the start of the survey. A slight plume of dust and gas escapes from the southwest side of the mountain. At the same time, the lake's surface bubbles, then subsides. The lake's level then, slowly drops. 
the volcano begins to erupt, just when the travelers run their first test flight of the high and dry. They learn the ship is flyable, but will need extensive repair work done, at the nearest high-tech level starport. Bushes can be seen catching fire, and the air is filling with superheated dust and ash. The travelers receive a number of transmissions. One is from Minister Greener, the other is from the mayor of Salbury Town. Minister Greener wants to know, what is happening? He is getting reports of smoke and tremors from the mountain. He wants the travelers, to fly around the mountain, and report what they see. This will not be the only time, he contacts the travelers, for an update. Likewise, the mayor of Salbury wants to know, what is happening? Tremors have been felt in the town, and dark plumes can be seen issuing from the volcano. The Walston authorities have dispatched security personnel, fire and rescue workers, and like, to the region. The next chain of events assume the travelers are cooperative with Minister Greener and the Walston government instead of taking the ship and running. There is a lot of smoke and ash coming from the volcano. This is odd. I am detecting missiles being launched at us from the volcano. Oh. Wait a minute. I now see what the trouble is. An odd rock, or two, are flung from the volcano, causing the ship's sensors to constantly give whaling missile alerts, making the ship's flight tricky. Via visual and the ship's sensors, the travelers can report to Minister Greener that lava is flowing out of the volcano, but the town of Salbury I is not in any danger. However, the village of Barvin and its surrounding hamlets are in danger. Via various transmissions, people at farms and settlements south of Salbury I are told to evacuate to the town of Salbury I. The fishing submarine, Ocean's Bounty, surfaces and is only able to evacuate a handful of people from Barvin. A train is being sent from Salbury I to Barvin to evacuate people from the region. Similarly, the Walston government has three Grav vehicles that are all being sent to Barvin to evacuate people. If the travelers have offered to help, Dictator Master Tan, who is the ruler of the planet, will radio them and ask them to get estimates of the lava flow rates and to report on the conditions of the dirt road that leads to Barvin and of the volcano itself. A few minutes later, the dictator again calls the travelers. The dictator tells them that two group of people need rescuing. One has 11 people at an agricultural settlement or farming hamlet and are unable to reach Barvin. The other group are the dictator's Varga chauffeur's parents. The dictator asks the travelers to save the group of 11 people. With the dictator's permission, the chauffeur has taken the dictator's limousine and is going to save her mother and father. There are still people in Barvin when the last train out leaves. The adventure makes no mention on how the travelers will learn or are informed of this. Perhaps the dictator radios them. If the high and dry has landed and is taking aboard refugees, the volcano erupts one more time. This time with pyroclastic flows. The pyroclastic flow will reach Barvin in four to five minutes. The travelers can get the ship out of danger either by flying above the pyroclastic flow or by flying out to sea and submerging the ship. However, the travelers will get a distress call from the Varga chauffeur. The chauffeur was able to pick up her parents, is heading for the coast and is a minute or two ahead of the pyroclastic flow. Rescuing them will put the travelers, the ship, and the refugees into considerable danger with the very real possibility of a TPK, a D and D term for total party killed. After rescuing them, assuming they attempt to do so, the travelers can 1. Attempt to fly the ship up and above the pyroclastic flow. This is the riskiest. Or 2. Attempt to fly the ship out to sea and submerge it. This is less risky. Or, 3, attempt to fly the ship head-on into the pyroclastic flow. Turns out, this is the least riskiest of maneuvers. If the travelers did anything to help, even if it were the minimal effort of only surveying the volcano, they will be considered as heroes. How much of heroes depends on how many refugees they manage to save.
the Wollstone government will do their best to repair the high and dry. In the least, the ship will be flyable and jump capable. Unfortunately, the Walston government does not have the funds to substantially reward the travelers for their rescue efforts. The High and Dry, along with its travelers, depart Walston. At Flammarion, the travelers are given accommodations at a nice hotel by the IISS, while the High and Dry is being overhauled, which takes a couple of weeks. There are a number of non-player characters the travelers will interact with. However, the adventure hardly gives any details on any of them, leaving the game master to create their personalities, behaviors, and background. With the exception of the former crew of the High and Dry, displayed on the screen, are the main NPCs the travelers will interact with. Actually, the only NPCs that are given any details are the former crew of the High and Dry. They are obnoxious, loud-mouthed, offensive, jerks, who are now stewing in jail cells. They have made many enemies. Because of their actions, many throughout this sector of space hold grudges against them. Thus, in future adventures, if they are flying around in the high and dry ship, the game master can have the travelers run into people who are harboring a grudge against the previous crew. As another future adventure plot hook suggestion, you can have the former crew break out of jail and are now looking to hijack the high and dry spaceship from the travelers. The bureaucrat, Mr. Anders Kasarii, of the Imperial Interstellar Scout Services, serves as the quest giver for the adventure. Likewise, he can serve as the quest giver for any future adventures for the travelers. Michelle Corelli is the captain of the Far Trader, Type A2 class spaceship, called the Autumn Gold. The ship is functional, but not luxurious. She and her mixed crew will get the travelers to planet Wollstone. Before getting to Wollstone, the Autumn Gold will make a stop at the planet designated as 567-908 in order to drop off a few crates of supplies for its starport. Due to often being contracted by the Imperial Navy, she and her crew have learned to be secretive and are tight-lipped and not too talkative. To make the journey more exciting, I would suggest adding a pirate raid during their trip. Alan Greener is Planet Wollstone's Minister of Off-World Affairs, Public Relations, and Fisheries. He knows the location of the high and dry ship. He will not divulge its location until the travelers agree to complete the survey of Mount Salbury that the former crew of the high and dry failed to do. The former crew was already paid to do the survey, hence, Minister Greener is reluctant to offer any further compensation to the travelers. If the travelers insist, then Minister Greener is only willing to offer a flat fee of 3,000 credits upon completion of the job. The adventure does not give the mayor of Salbury I Town a name. The travelers' only interactions with the mayor will be via radio transmissions when Mount Salbury I starts to erupt. The ruler of Planet Wollstone is Dictator Masterton. When the travelers make Planet Fall at Wollstone, they will not have any interactions with the Dictator, even if they were to pursue it. The only interactions with the Dictator will be via radio transmissions when Mount Salbury I starts to erupt. So, in this adventure, the so-called damsel in distress is the high and dry ship itself. Vessels operated by the Imperial Interstellar Scout Service are registered under a number rather than a name. The High and Dry is officially designated IISS S001642C. The ship was originally built at a yard in Gushmidge Sector. It has seen service in all three major branches of the Scout Service, which are exploration, survey, and communications. Though most of her time was spent on communications duty, hence the C on the end of her registry number. Quite some time ago, the ship was dubbed high and dry by her crew, and the name stuck. Though no one, now, in the IISS, know what the name refers to, nor the reasoning behind the title. The ship has acquired innumerable dents and dings, along with an incomprehensible number of minor modifications, and more. The high and dry has been part of the scout service's detached duty pool for decades now. Its crew can use the vessel for private use, with the understanding that the ship can be recalled to duty at any time. 
However, the High and Dry has been quite abused by her last crew. A few months ago, the High and Dry suffered a serious failure in her control electronics, which essentially rendered her drives useless. She was at that time parked in the crater of Mount Selbury on Wollstone. To the travelers, the High and Dry is a gift horse. However, when they look at this gift horse's mouth, they will see it has only a few teeth. And the few teeth it does have, are bad and rotting. The so-called villain of this adventure, is Mount Salbury, which was at first thought, to be an inactive volcano. The volcano's first tremor, occurs when the travelers are, halfway through their survey. The volcano then begins to erupt, during the high and dry's test flight. So the volcano's activity, is tied to certain story plot points in the adventure. To keep your players guessing, and to add suspense, and to make them think that the volcano's activity is random. As a game master, I would make fake dice rolls, behind the GM screen. I will now walk through the adventures, various worlds, and maps. Let us start with the adventure's hexagonal map, where each hex is a parsec, or 3.26 light years, in length. The travelers begin on Flammarion. From there, they then travel to 567-908, a drab, dreary, and depressing planet. They then travel to Wollston, where the bulk of the adventure takes place in. Just as an aside, in Traveller, each one parsec jump takes one week of time to traverse. RPG Mods fan has modified this in his Traveller games, aka a house rule. In his games, each jump takes only one week, instead of depending on the number of parsecs traversed. As an example, if a jump 3 capable ship jumps 3 parsecs, then the travel time is one week, instead of three weeks, under official traveler rules. You will notice that the worlds on the map have the traveler 8-digit universal world profile, or UWP, code, which gives a lot of information about them. I will go over only the three worlds, the travelers will be on. Let us start with Flammarion. Flammarion star is an F8 primary star. The F means that it is a yellow-white star, which have surface temperatures ranging from 600 to 7500 Kelvin. The 8 means the star burns near the lower range of the aforementioned temperature scale. As reference, Earth's sun is a G2 primary star. Thus, Flammarion's star is larger, and burns hotter, than Earth's sun. Flammarion has a UWP code of, A623514B. The first digit of A, means Flammarion has an excellent starport facility, which, by the way, is called Starport Liberty. And, it is where the travelers begin their adventure. The starport has all the expected amenities, including refined fuel for starships brokerage services for passengers and cargo, and a variety of ship provisions. There is a shipyard capable of doing annual maintenance, overhauls, and other kinds of repair, and construction of both, starships and non-starships. The second digit of 6, means Flammarion has a diameter of about 9,600 km, whose gravity is low, at about 0.7 g. The third digit of 2, means Flammarion has a trace atmosphere. Hence, a vacuum suit is required, when walking around outside on the planet's surface. The fourth digit of 3, means 26 to 35% of Flammarion's surface, is covered by water. The fifth digit of 5, means Flammarion has a population that numbers in the hundreds of thousands. The sixth digit of 1, means Flammarion has a government run by a corporation. The seventh digit of 4, means Flammarion has a moderate law level, where most weapons, such as light assault weapons, submachine guns, all energy weapons, etc., are banned, as well as body armor. The eighth digit of B, means Flammarion is a tech level 11 world. The trade codes of PO and NI, means that Flammarion is a poor non-industrial world. In addition, the world has an imperial navy base, and a scout service way station, Next, let us look at the world designated as 567-908. Due to its low importance to the Imperium, it has not yet even been given a name. 567-908 is within a binary solar system. 
It orbits the larger star, which is a Category 3 giant star, named Laragii. Laragii is a K5 star. The K means that it is an orange star, which have surface temperatures ranging from 3500 to 1500 Kelvin. The 5 means the star burns near the middle range of the aforementioned temperature scale. 567-908 has a UWP code of E53200-0. The first digit of E means the world starport is a frontier quality installation, with few expected amenities. There is unrefined fuel for starships, and a limited variety of ship provisions. There is no shipyard of any kind, but there may be parts and technical support for doing minor services and repair. The starport at 567-908 is operated by a few scout service personnel and some private contractors. The second digit of 5 means the planet has a diameter of about 8,000 kilometers, whose gravity is low, at about 0.45 g. The third digit of 3 means the planet has a very thin atmosphere. A respirator is needed in order to walk around outside on its surface. The fourth digit of 2 means 16 to 25 percent of 567-908s surface is covered by water. In other words, it is a dry planet. The fifth digit of 0 means the world is uninhabited. Actually, there are a few inhabitants who are tasked by the Imperium to operate the planet's rudimentary starport. The sixth digit of zero means the world does not have a government. The seventh digit of zero means the world has no law. The eighth digit of zero means the planet is a tech level zero world. The trade code of BA means that 567-908 is a barren world. Displayed on the screen is a map of 567-908's rudimentary starport facility. The Autumn Gold Far Trader spaceship will be stopping over for a day at the starport. The adventure already has a slow boring start. This planet is also boring, hence the Game Master's players may get bored and disappointed. So, do not make this stop a waste of time. If the Game Master is going to run an extended traveler campaign, then they should put in clues and hints of future adventures here. Otherwise, tell your players that after spending a day on the planet, they realize 567-908 is a drab, dreary, and depressing planet, and that the autumn gold is ready to depart. Walston orbits Albin star, which is an M2 primary star. The M means that it is a red dwarf star, which have surface temperatures ranging from 2000 to 3500 Kelvin. The 2 means Albin star burns near the upper range of that temperature scale. Orbiting Albin star are five rocky planets and two small gas giants named Invise and Greenish. Walston has a UWP code of C544338-8. The first digit of C means the Walston starport is an average quality installation, which includes expected amenities, unrefined fuel for starships, some brokerage services for passengers and cargo, and a variety of ship provisions. There is a shipyard capable of doing maintenance and other kinds of repair. The second digit of 5 means the planet has a diameter of about 8,000 km, whose gravity is low, at about 0.45 g. The third digit of 4 means the planet has a thin and tainted atmosphere. A filter mask is needed in order to function outside, on its surface, for an extended period of time. The adventure itself states, filter masks and thick clothing are needed when venturing outside. The fourth digit of four means 36 to 45 percent of Walston surface is covered by water. The fifth digit of three means Walston has a population that numbers in the thousands. A little over 3,000, to be more precise. Some 90% of the population are Varga, and nearly the rest are human. The Varga are upright walking humanoids, with wolf and canine features and traits. The sixth digit of three means Walston's government is classified as a self-perpetuating oligarchy. A hereditary dictatorship is a more accurate description of Walston's government. The seventh digit of eight means Walston has a high law level. 
Practically all weapons and armor are banned. This makes sense. As a dictator, you would, not, want your citizens to be armed, and run the risk of being overturned by them. As a dictator, you would have an ongoing propaganda program, for why arms should be, and continue to be, outlawed. The eighth digit of eight, means Wallston is a tech level eight world. The trade codes of LO and NI, means that Wallston is a low population, non-industrialized, world. Wallston does not have the funds, to exploit any potential resources on the planet. Dictator Masterton is negotiating with a few imperial corporations, with a view to licensing mining, and other economic installations, in remote areas of the planet. However, he is insisting on ridiculously high licensing fees, which is irritating his counterparties. Displayed on the screen, is the 20-sided, polyhedral map, of planet Wallston. For comparison purposes, displayed now on the screen, is the 20-sided polyhedral map of present-day planet Earth. Wallston's orbit lies on the fringe of its star's habitable zone. It is not an inviting world. It is rather dry, and thanks to its thin atmosphere, it has highly variable temperatures. During the day, it does not get excessively warm. At night, the temperature plummets to well below zero Celsius, freezing the surfaces of most of Wallston's waters and seas. The only area that is inhabited, is Settlement Island. Even though the Varga make up, the vast majority of the population, they are considered as second-class citizens. Off-world Varga tend to become offended by this. Yet, most of the people of Wallston, live slow, comfortable, unambitious lives, and get along well enough. Wallston has a mainly subsistence economy, based on conventional farming and agriculture, and, on shallow water, seabed farming, off the island's ice-free western coast. What manufacturing there is, operates as what are, effectively cottage industries, in the three main settlements. Most buildings and homes are blocky, with rounded corners, and sunk into the ground, rather than built upwards. Wallston's inhabitants keep their indoor temperatures quite warm. When indoors, they tend to wear light clothing. A kilt, and a light shirt or tunic, are the most common dress for both sexes. The Varga tend to wear more colorful outfits, than the humans. Wallston's starport and capital, lies more on the central part of Settlement Island. Wallston's starport, is located in Star Town. The starport employs a few dozen people, and brings in a modest income from passing vessels, crews stopping over, and so forth. Spaceships come through fairly regularly, sometimes two or more in a single day. When the travelers first pass through passport control, as a game master, I would have filter masks, and thick clothing, available for sale, at a big markup, at stores situated just after passport control. When the travelers learn that the high and dry is not berthed at the starport, they then can start asking around for its whereabouts. Pretty much anyone in town will suggest asking at the Port Authority office, as well as learning that its former crew were a bunch of jerks. At the Port Authority office, the travelers will learn that the ship is still on Wallston, and has been chartered to the world government of Wallston. Although the planet has a perfectly good communications net, the government will not release any information, unless the travelers go to the capital, in person, and meet with a government official. Meaning, the travelers will need to travel to Central Lake, the capital of Wallston, in order to learn more. At Central Lake, the dictator's palace, and government offices, lie near the center of town. Keep in mind, Wallston has a small population. The reception desk at the government offices is usually manned, most of the time, but does not have a full-time receptionist. Travelers might be stunned by this. In fact, employees of Wallston's government, each have multiple jobs, and are overworked. Eventually, Minister Alan Greener will meet with the travelers. Once an agreement is reached, Minister Greener will inform the travelers, that the high and dry is in the caldera of Mount Selbury The next task for the travelers, is to climb Mount Selbury The mountain is a little over 1,500 meters above sea level. Due to the already thin atmosphere, climbing it, will be challenging, with the danger of altitude sickness, 
and, with the very real possibility, of a few travelers perishing. The adventure splits the climb into seven subsections, and is, basically, a rock climbing simulation. Three quarters of the way up, the travelers will find the grisly remains of two mountain climbers. Overall, players will find the whole mountain climbing section of the adventure, to be long, tedious, and not fun. If the travelers have filter masks, respirators, thick clothing, and had the foresight of getting rock climbing equipment, then, as a game master, I would condense this section to only a few minutes of gameplay, and not make the climb too challenging. The high and dry is parked, in the middle of an island, in the middle of a crater lake, in the cauldron of Mount Selbury. The crater lake is 200 meters below, the mountain top lip of Mount Selbury. When the travelers reach the high and dry, they will encounter, the former crews, abandoned, starving, and now aggressive, pet, a Tenchers wolf. If given food, and treated kindly, the Tenchers wolf can become the new pet of the travelers. When the travelers reach and get inside the high and dry, they will realize, that the former crew has stripped the ship of anything that is valuable, and carryable at the same time. However, once the replacement control electronics have been installed, the ship is functional and flyable. Before the travelers make their first test flight, a tremor will be felt. Just when they initiate their test flight, the volcano begins to erupt. The volcano's tremors can be felt, all the way to the town of Salbury. Its smoke, an eventual eruption, can also be seen, by the folk at Salbury. The volcano's lava, and pyroclastic flows, will wipe out the village of Barvin. Will the travelers survive Mount Salbury's eruption? Will they manage to save at least a few people, and hence be considered as heroes to the people of Wollstone? Or will they risk everything, and manage to save everyone? Well, that depends on your group of players. Hopefully, they will not turn out to be, just like the former crew of the high and dry. 4. New creatures make their debut to Traveller, in this adventure. They are. The Alderson's Coastal Hunter. The Deep Water Brakar. The Wollstone. And, the Tenchers Wolf. Alderson's Coastal Hunter and the Deep Water Brakar, are the only two seagoing animals, that pose any real threat to humans. The Territorial Alderson's Coastal Hunter, normally hunts, by either, surging from cover to grab small prey, or by entangling larger invertebrates with its tail. The more dangerous deep water brakar, prefer much deeper and colder waters, and are rarely sighted near settlement island. The rabbit-sized wallstones, are land-dwelling, fairly harmless, egg-laying burrowers. They are kept as pets, by many families on Wallstone. They are sociable and loyal beasts. Wallstones are vegetarian, and easy to care for. The Tenchers wolf is an omnivore, the size of a large dog, and similar in temperament. Under normal conditions, they make reliable guard animals, and companions. Roll Credits Displayed are the credits found within the adventure itself. High and Dry is the perfect introductory adventure for Traveller, full of exploration, character interaction, and a truly explosive finale. It does a fantastic job of showcasing, what travelers' strengths are. There are plenty of challenges for the travelers to face. The adventure can also be run without any combat whatsoever. However, as a game master, I would suggest to add an antagonist or two. If you have any ideas on how to make this adventure even better, please share them in the comments below. Thank you for watching, from all of us, at the RPG Mods Fan Spaceship. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment. We do like feedback, and we try to respond to as many comments as we can. Till next time, on behalf of RPG Mods Fan, I am Peaches, saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. Caught up in my thoughts Wondering if
pure for love only. 